Thank you very much Matilda and Annie for the previous two talks. It kind of sets up my talk, hopefully. I've had a personal story and I've shared the stage with Matilda before and I always find the story very profound. We've had a very practical approach to how to avoid error. And I'm going to go off piste and give an abstract view on how I think it works and what the potential solutions are. And it kind of ties together with the previous two talks. Why did people send Matilda home? What was the problem on multiple occasions? Why didn't they make that diagnosis? And hopefully I'll give a little insight into what's happening there. I'm going to change my strap line, the complexity, error, team working and human factors. And I'm going to talk about systemic and systematic errors. And that kind of ties in where the big problems lie, in the system and individuals. I've no conflicts of interest, but I suppose I should declare that this is a very personal view. So I've not extracted this from any um, high-flying scientific article. It's very much my own view on how I think it works. These are my affiliations. And hopefully by the end of the talk I'm going to cover these few things. To define what I mean by systemic errors, to define systematic error, to postulate that error results from a weak mind in a weak system, what I mean by that, and hopefully to present a few solutions. Now, if, if at any point you want to challenge me on any of these, do feel free. I'm always up for a robust challenge. So let's start with systemic or system-based errors. What We believe these errors creep in because we like to use the phrase, we work in a complex system. What do we mean by that? It's a, it's a word we throw in um, when we don't really understand what's happening and maybe when things get hard. But do we really know what a complex system is? And different people conceive of it in a different way. So I'm going to define what I mean by a complex system. It's what I would call a low validity environment. And this is, comes from our cognitive psychology literature. When they talk about low validity environments, they talk about irregular or unpredictable environments. But more importantly, we've not had an opportunity to practice in that environment. And that's what makes it complex, is that not only is it unfamiliar and unpredictable, but we've never been exposed to it before. And you can kind of see how those dynamic healthcare situations you face kind of look something like this. And this is the environment that errors creep in. So it's kind of tease out how this complex environment or this unpredictable environment works, I'm going to use a few physics-based models because often it's, it's helpful to, to understand abstract concepts by um, examples of uh, physical theories that we understand better. So what I think, how I think we're interpreting a complex environment what we think of complexity is that these systems are equilibrium states. So when you talk about equilibrium, you're talking about second law of thermodynamics. Don't worry, I'm not going to get too abstract about the physics. And if we think it's an equilibrium state, we think, OK, we can monitor it as an equilibrium state and know and predict when things are likely to go wrong. So we use it as a prediction model. And hopefully I'll, I'll bring you back to how this is interpreted in reality. So we say that, okay, if we conceive of this environment as an equilibrium state, we can predict deviation from the norm as a low quality environment. So we're always thinking, well, is performance in your organization or your unit or your theaters, what's the quality of that performance? And we like to measure it, and we usually measure it in terms of this um, equilibrium model. And we've all seen these kind of graphs, statistical control charts, and you have these on your dashboards in your organization. So we're looking at performance, and we accept, okay, there's a bit of 
random variation around the mean, so-called common cause variation, and we accept that unless that variation strays too far from the mean, strays across those control limits. And we usually set those control limits as two standard deviations, three standard deviations, and so on. And if you stray into that territory of beyond your control limit, you think this is a poorly performing organization or unit, and we can predict that, okay, this is ripe for error, error is likely to occur. So here we are in your theaters, this is your control chart talking about any performance measure you like. Um, checking of patients, uh, standardization of procedure, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. And you think, well, my organization is performing pretty well. Bit of randi random variation around the mean, we accept that, but well within the control limit. So I've got a high performing organization, no worries. CQC will come, they look at your chart and they'll be quite happy with that. And then that happens. And everyone's taken aback and say, where did that come from? That's come completely out the blue. We've got a never event. And we thought never events indicated a poor performance. But does it? Because our control chart has told us we're performing well. And for me, this is problematic because if we conceive of our system, our performance system, as an equilibrium state and we're monitoring it like that, then it's not telling us about how we may prepare or anticipate these rare random events, say a never event. So we, in fact, they're not poorly predicted, they cannot be predicted. So I think we need a different way of thinking about the system we work in, the complexity of the system. And for me, the alternative paradigm is it's not an equilibrium state, and I would describe it as a non-equilibrium steady state. So the steady state is what's happening day to day, and that's your control chart telling you nothing's happening. And the physical corollary is an avalanche or an earthquake or a tsunami. So everything's going along quite nicely for years, for decades, for centuries. And then suddenly, out of the blue, you have this catastrophic occurrence. And similarly to a never event, everything's going along quite fine until suddenly you get a never event. And another, uh, this is becoming quite popular in the physics literature, and they call these self-organized critical states. The physical model for this Say you imagined a pile of sand, or some uh, workers describe it as a pile of rice, it doesn't really matter. So you gradually add grains of sand to the top of the pile, and the pile gets bigger and bigger and bigger, until suddenly, and you can't predict when, the frictional forces between the grains suddenly give, they're overcome by gravity, and you get a slip. And that slip can be small, it can be huge. And you can't predict when, and you can't predict the size. And that's what I conceive of the healthcare system we work in to, those are the kind of physics behind the complexity for rare random events. Is you never know when it's gonna happen, you don't know the size of the error that's gonna result. And those grains of sand, if you substitute that for the latent error, and the latent error can be various things in your system, including decision making, which I'm going to talk about, they pile up and as the sand pile gets bigger and bigger, the latent error keeps adding until you reach a point of criticality and then everything collapses and you get your never event. And this, I think, explains more the kind of paradigm we're working in. And the main problem is we're still stuck with the with the uh, unpredictability of the never event. It's a different paradigm. I think it's important to think of it differently, but you're still stuck with a prediction of when the catastrophic event's going to happen. <coughs> so what's the evidence behind this? <coughs> Very nice study was done in anesthesia, I think about a year ago now. In fact, no, 2016. And it looked at all the never events in UK, 
And it, what it did is it compared those never events to the volume of surgery being performed in the different units. And it came up with this very interesting graph. It's basically a Poisson distribution. And that's a signature of a rare random event. That kind of turns on its head our belief that never events are a sign of a poorly performing organization. Actually they're not, they're completely random, they come out of the blue, they are unpredictable. It's nothing to do with quality of performance and the, um, the conclusion they came to, it's not a use, useful metric to judge the quality of care and it isn't, it's random. And that's what makes it so interesting. And just to illustrate how random events work when you um, illustrate them graphically, the red line shows a rare random event with a Poisson distribution, and that's your never event occurrence. As the events become more common, you move to eventually the graph we understand well, the normal distribution. So a common random event, common errors, show that um, normal distribution. And again, this is more in keeping with an equilibrium system, whereas that non-equilibrium steady state, I think, behaves more like a Poisson distribution. So we come back to the question, can we eliminate harm? Errors are random events, big errors are rare random events. Therefore, I would propose that actually never events should be called always events. They will happen, it's just a matter of time, and you cannot prevent them. So you might as well say, well, let's be nihilistic about the whole thing, we'll just go home and wait for the next never event and accept it. It's just, it just is. But I think there may be solutions, and the solutions lie in what, what happens at the level of attribution. So I don't think the attributability lies in the behaviour of a collective, the department, the organisation and so on. I think attribution lies at the individual level, and that's where we need to target the most effective interventions. So we come to another definition. What do we mean by human factors? And almost certainly we're going to hear that, hear that term in every talk today because it's what we think we understand. It ties in very closely to error, patient safety. But I would contest that we use the term differently and we understand it differently. And so I'm going to define how I'm going to use it for these purposes. I think human factors is about cognitive limitation of the individual. It's being held hostage to type 1 thinking. To me that's human factors, is how we as humans think. And this is where that systematic decision errors come in. This is where things happen like Matilda getting sent home repeatedly. Why do we make those decisions? Why are we likely to make those decisions again? <laughs> to illustrate how type 1 thinking works, I'm going to tell you a little story. My wife and I decided to hold a dinner party for friends and colleagues. And she thought it would be really nice to have a great centerpiece of a big bit of salmon, which would garnish and um, make look lovely, it would taste lovely. So she went to the shops, bought this magnificent bit of salmon, cooked it, put it on the kitchen table to let it cool down so she could garnish it and so on. Went out and about her chores, but when she came back, she was horrified. The cat had jumped up onto the kitchen table, was eating the salmon. So she was slightly hysterical, chucked the cat out the house and thought, how am I going to repair this? Actually, the cat had only eaten a bit out the middle of the salmon. So she thought, OK, not too bad, I'll try and disguise it. She took bits and pieces off the side, kind of stuffed it in the hole, put some garnish over it, and actually it didn't look too bad. Slightly worried, but she served it up for supper. 
and nobody noticed any difference. Everyone was happy. In fact, when they went home, they complimented her on the spread, and they were very happy, and she was very happy. So everything turned out well. Next morning, about mid-morning, she phoned me again, absolutely hysterical, and said to me, first words, the cat has died. I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Cat had the salmon, cat's dead. I thought, maybe I'll keep quiet about it, I'm not feeling too bad. But we live in a time of duty of candour, so I thought I'd better phone around all the colleagues and friends and let them know what's happened, and so I did. I said, you may want to get yourself checked out at your GP. Got home that night feeling slightly depressed because this whole dinner party had gone sour now. My wife met me at the door. She said, the neighbours are really upset. I said, why are the neighbours upset? She said, well, they're the ones who ran over the cat. <laughs> and that is type one thinking. It's the immediate, not only assumptions, but the firm belief in a story when you're given unrelated facts. And in fact, type 1 thinking is insensitive to the quantity or the quality of the facts you're presented with. In fact, the fewer facts you have, the stronger the story you make. And so the story to me, the cat was dead, had the salmon, the salmon must have killed the cat. And that's the fallacy. We put together stories very easily and we don't challenge those stories. So a slight challenge to your thinking, I'm going to present you with three questions. Now I'd ask you not to confer on the answers, just have a look at the questions and just jot down your answers. I'm not going to ask you the answers. So this is for your personal um, edification only. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about each of these questions. just have to rank those answers. So from the most likely to the least likely. Okay. Move to the next, Appy, we'll move to the next question. Okay, final question. Okay, so these three questions are actually part of a study we conducted about a year ago now. And if I was to collect all your answers, it would look something like this, because these are the results of the study. And they were aimed at the same audience, really. You'll see in question one, slightly over half, the light shaded bars are the correct response. The, the black bars are the incorrect response. So there's something happening here. Question one and two are answered in a similar way. About half the respondents had the correct response, half had the incorrect response. Slightly over a half had the incorrect response. Whereas in question three, it's answered very differently. Most of the respondents got the correct answer. And you can see the significance, it's highly significant. Whereas the other two, didn't read significant. <coughs> Why is that? So if we go back, we look at question three, all the questions have the same construction. They're asking you about statistical probability. They're asking you to say what's statistically more likely in these choices you've got. 
Now in question three, most respondents get it. They get it correct, but in question one and two, they don't. They have exactly the same construction, but in question one and two, what's added is clinical information. That's the only difference. They're the same construction, but I've given you clinical information. And that clinical information has caused a lot of people to make irrational choices. Why is that? So question three tells me you know what statistical probability is, but question one and two, you've chosen not to give that answer. Why is that? So I'm not going to go, I'm happy to talk about that um, at the break, but I'm not going to go into what's affecting those decision making, but only to make the point that highly trained professionals are making irrational choices. Why is that? And it's about the way we think. So we're clever, that's why you do the job you do, but you're irrational at times. <coughs> And there's certain things that bring out that irrationality, and one of those things is a complex environment, an unpredictable, unfamiliar environment, and being given clinical information in such a way that makes you make a choice that's not correct. So I'm going to very briefly set out how the human mind works. So type 1 thinking resides at the very bottom, it's a hierarchical structure, and this is automatic, as those things you, your mind jumps to conclusions about, and the cat and the fish story. That's the story your mind builds automatically, and why does it do it? Because it costs no energy, it's easy. The cognitive load is minimal or nothing at all, it just happens in your head. And it happens to all of us, we're basically inherently lazy from a cognitive point of view. Or you could look at uh, cognitive entropy, you're saving energy. Hierarchically, what's controlling that autonomous mind, what makes us able to make clever decisions, is this algorithmic mind, and this is where intelligence resides. This is if I asked you what is 9 times 16, you'd have to sit and think about it and you'd be able to work it out eventually. Don't ask me to compute that. But this is, that question three, this is where this algorithmic mind's working because it's, a, a, a it's become a question of statistical probability which you recognize and you work it out. And you get it right most of the time. But the problem comes that the the type two, the system two, is actually made up of two different minds. And the mind that holds sway over everything is this reflective mind where choices and reasoning resides. And your, those first two questions, question one and two, this is where you were making your choice. And this, this mind can consider suggestions from the autonomous or the algorithmic mind, but it can kick those, those suggestions into touch and choose something different, even if it's irrational. And this is where the problem lies for us, because depending on how information is presented to you, if you're a young woman who's pregnant, you're not going to have cancer. There's no ways. So you've got indigestion, you've got constipation, you've got something related to the pregnancy. Because you're pregnant, you're young, this is what happens. And this is how our minds work. We, we don't rationalize it. We, we base it on stereotypic presentations. And it's almost that representativeness that we choose. Well, this represents a young pregnant person who's more likely to have constipation, so I'm not going to worry about it. So ultimately, the solutions are recognizing the fact that humans are human. We have a brain that works in a certain way and we need to recognize that. We, we need to recognize that our brain works in a certain way in a certain environment, and that environment we'll call a complex environment. And when that, that irrationality, or rather the influence on our mind, 
is occurring in a low validity environment, that's where trouble starts. And that's where error kicks in, irrational, cho irrational choices get made. And remember that the, um, but the trickle of sand grains on the pile? So those irrational decisions build up into this ever-increasing sand pile until you get the collapse and you get your catastrophic <coughs> error. So solution number one, I think, is understanding the architecture of decision making. How does the mind work so that we can at least start to compensate and build in um, safety measures so that we don't make incorrect decisions? Now, we're influenced by heuristics and biases. Heuristics is the good bit where your autonomous, autonomous mind, based on your skill and experience, will come to rapid solutions, so-called fast and frugal thinking, in a very positive way. That's what makes you a professional. You walk into a room, you don't need the blood pressure or pulse or other signs of a patient. You can see a patient is sick. And that's based on heuristics, which is a positive thing. But that usually is a positive thing in a predictable environment where you've practiced many times. It becomes a bias, in other words, it makes you make irrational choices when the environment is wrong. And we need to distinguish the two environments and be cautious when we enter that complex environment which becomes unpredictable. We need to recognize and manage the low validity environments. And this is where the standardized decision making comes in. So we recognize in a theatre, it's hugely complex. There are many things happening all the time. I have a limited cognitive capacity. How do I deal with this? I have to short circuit my thinking. So I've got to actually put a block on my own choices because I know my choices are as good as flipping a coin. It may depend on what I've had for breakfast, what I did last night, how my last patient I had, they become irrational choices. We need to recognize that. And the solution is to standardize the decision making in your protocols. And, that's quite, and I think that's quite nice. We saw the NATSIPS protocols and guidelines and so on. And we need to use our cognitive aids, the checklists, the bundles and so on, because they help us through this unfamiliar environment or this challenging environment. And we now have an opportunity that we never had a couple of decades ago. We can now train in low validity environments because we can recreate them. In the good old days, we never had this opportunity. And so we had to uh, wait for opportunities when things went wrong, um, the environment was challenging and kind of see how our decisions played out and try to learn from that for the next time we were faced with that same kind of scenario. Now we don't have to do that. We can recreate these challenging complex environments in a simulated environment and we can have this deliberate practice for uh, any scenario you can concoct really. And so I think part of the solution is definitely simulation-based learning to recreate complexity. Not so much to part of it to practice our decision making, but also to recognize when we need to fall back on protocols and guidelines and cognitive aids. And the fourth part of the solution, I think, is training for this collective competence. So I know I have a limited cognitive capacity and it gets overwhelmed pretty quickly. And so part of that solution is not to depend on an individual's capacity, but to share that cognitive load. And this is where the team-based learning comes in, the team-based performance, that we are no longer expert individuals that can handle any situation like the good old days. We believed if we were skilled to a certain level, throw anything at me and I can deal with it. It doesn't happen. And so we have to accept that the future and beating error is about working effectively in teams and practicing in those teams. And that's why I said when we're answering those questions, don't confer. If you were able to confer 
the response would have been very different. We would have got a much higher rate of correct answers because it's kind of sharing that cognitive load, talking through it, and working out the right answer. So in summary, I think error lies in the interaction between a mind prone to associative or irrational decisions and it operates in an irregular or complex environment. And back to my original point, it's a weak mind in a weak system. Thank you very much.